This is part three with uh, Salina Kareem, the author of Secular Jinnah in Pakistan. Hope you have enjoyed part one and two with her. Please let me know what you think of these uh, interviews with her and any other interview on Light Up Vichwa podcast. Send me your feedback and comments on lightupvichwa.com and I look forward to hearing from you. Take care. So what would we say to this world we live in about things of this nature? Like any any lesson to be learned from here? I mean... Yeah, uh, that's a good question. Um, the lesson to learn um, really uh, is to say that words are all powerful um, and we have to be extremely careful how we use them. Uh, I think I read once before that the final task of philosophy is to master linguistics. It's considered now the final task of philosophy and the reason for that is because it's known now that words are extremely powerful um, and how they're interpreted individually and uh, within various nations and within various religious groups or ideological groups all of that there's the you know where philosophy is now looking for some sort of universal way to communicate because there have been so many problems and they have tended to come down to words um, and this is really well it's an amazing example possibly the best example in uh, recent times of uh, how powerful a misquote can be um especially when you consider how it has been used again and again and it's been accepted in scholarship it's not that it's been you know oh it's just being uh, taken among uh, the ordinary uh, writers and commentators it's, it's been it's been taken to the top uh, so um it has come like i say and also actually i'll uh just to kind of yeah yeah go ahead emphasize this uh, to, to kind of further answer your question um there are three ways okay. up to three ways <laughs> that okay. this uh, quote has been used and the way that the secularists have uh produced that argument combination uh to to kind of uh, cause confusion albeit a lot of them don't mean to, it's just the way it has happened. Uh, one is that it's had a effect on constitution making. It has, uh, it has influenced attitudes. It has influenced the way that people want to um, tackle the constitution or change the constitution, as there is a story in my book again, which I won't go into here, but there is a story to do with someone's attempt to change the constitution. Um, and uh, as an early historical example, um, and it has been going ongoing, the sovereignty resting in the people line has been explicitly uh, used to undermine the objectives resolution of Pakistan because there it's mentioned about sovereignty resting in God. Um, so um, it's always said that, oh, look, well, we're talking about sovereignty resting in the people according to Jinnah, and we've kind of defied his wishes by mentioning sovereignty resting in God, when in fact Jinnah didn't, he simply didn't use that phrase in the first place. So um, that's part of it. So there's a constitutional problem, and there is also an educational problem. Um, uh, as I'm sure you may be familiar, um, there is a there is um, a real problem in Pakistan with the education curricula, uh, especially when it comes to history and um, the ideological part of history. Um, and there is there is it's such a strange thing to observe now that in light of this problem that you, you can see that why there are people pulling on one side for uh, you know, a, a more secular curriculum. And then you've got people on the other side, no, we, we want a more ideological curriculum. So it has affected that. I've seen it being used expressly to, to kind of say, no, 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 this, this needs to be removed or that needs to be removed. Um, it's also, it's affected, the, you know, the, the popular culture, if you like, and the media as well. It's affected that because what happens is there are so many um, discussion shows, TV panel shows, all, all those kinds of shows. And every few months, whenever there's a an important date, whether it's Independence Day or Gaidel's birthday um, or his uh, de death anniversary or you mm -hmm. name it, anything to do with Gaidel's, there is this tendency for everyone to stop talking about, oh, well, what was the Pakistan idea? And inevitably, the same old arguments keep coming up um, and, you know, the Munir quote is a part of that, that, um, that set of um, okay. old, same stuff coming up again and again. And, um, um, you know, this is, 
it's only adding to the problem. So you've got this educational problem, you've got this constitutional problem, and then you've got this general media problem, you know, is this everywhere? Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a lie reproduced again and again until it becomes a fact. And um, to kind of answer your question on, well, what are we going to, how how is this, is it going to make a difference? How is it going to make a difference? I think um, because it is the reality sooner or later, um, I'm a little bit, um, you know, philosophical about it. I, I say that sooner or later it will catch up and it will just, it will take over. Um, and the good news is um, the, my book has already been used as a reference in, you know, uh, several people's uh, PhD or master's theses. And in fact, one uh, one thesis um, actually was focused entirely on the contents of my uh, book. So um, this this is very heartening to me. I, I, I find that um, I find that um, to be very positive, a, a very positive outcome. And it kind of validates my belief that uh, sooner or later it, it is going to come out anyway. Another place it has had the effect and probably the biggest effect is in the academia. Um, it's um, it's become an accepted um, standard argument throughout uh, the world. So wherever you find South Asian uh, studies, you will always find this quote being used to describe a secular jinnah. Um, and actually, while we're on the subject, and the other thing I, uh, I would like to mention, actually, before I forget to mention it, is this concept of the categories, because I, I talk about this in my book, that there are three known images of Jinnah in the mm. academia. Mm. So there is the um, religious ideologue, there is the secular liberal, and then there is the one that's in between, and everybody knows it, or, you know, and it's a beginning to gain um attention again recently that you know perhaps there is a middle ground and he was neither nor and that's called the synthesis category or a hybrid category i've seen it now being referred to as well um and that's this idea of having secularism and islam kind of the best of both the the trouble with that is um you know to go back to iqbal he kind of said well islam brooks no division there's you know it's this, this concept of unity in with matter and spirit there's no such thing as a division so um yeah the third group they want to take the best of islam the best of secularism in their view so they're not afraid to quote all of jinnah's uh, speeches as far as they're concerned they, they are comfortable quoting everything so they're comfortable quoting the manir quote whereas the religion uh, uh, religious conservatives would not be comfortable quoting the manir quote mm. they are comfortable with quoting um the statements against theocracy and the statements calling uh, adv advocating um uh, islam they they say we have no problem with this because uh, you know Jinnah was neither nor he kind of believed in a fusion he he he, he was happy to kind of take the best of both the, the problem with that is that uh, you, if you actually pay close attention to, especially if you bring in Iqbal's point of view um, and look at how Jinnah was presenting his argument, he never once talked about synthesis. He never said we're going to bring in the best of something and the best. He just talked about Islam the whole time. And he uh, also... He placed a huge emphasis on Muslim unity. He had abandoned what uh, he was always known for in the beginning. In the beginning, he was known for being a uh, ambassador of Hindu Muslim unity. He was known for that. It's yeah. a, it was a you know a kind of an honorary title that had been given to him. But once he abandoned uh, his post as uh, that kind of ambassador, he focused entirely on Muslim unity. And whenever he spoke of Muslim unity, and this is key, whenever he spoke of Muslim unity, he spoke of it as um, political unity. He spoke of it as regional unity because there's a, there were, of course, all these problems with uh, different um, provincial um, interests, uh, conflicting interests. Um, and then there was the religious unity. And he was above sectarianism. He 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 was very keen to advance this idea and put it in the minds of people that if you're voting 
for the Muslim League, you're voting for a as as a Muslim and not as uh, you know as a as a certain caste or a certain sect of Islam or a certain from a certain part of India. You are just going to be there as a Muslim. And in fact, it was even on a census form. He was the people were being asked to put down what they what group they belong to, what community they belong to. And he said, your answer should be for religion, Muslim, and nothing else. Do not mention your sectarian affiliations in your head. We're trying to you know delete them from our political consciousness if you like so that is something that the uh, the synthesis category um has not really grabbed hold of they haven't understood it so they haven't put any emphasis on this uh, uh, section of Jinnah's speeches and they are so so important um they are what actually makes it possible for you to say oh yeah this is the difference between um, a non-sectarian view of Islam versus a synthesis view, uh, a hybrid view. So that's why I say there is actually a fourth category and it has not been appraised yet in academia. My next question is like, what is the value of gratitude in your life? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, gratitude is something that uh, I believe in very strongly. Um, I... Day to day, my gratitude is not really so much with the things I'm doing or have achieved or anything, um, mm -hmm. even though I am grateful for those. I tend not to give them active thought. Mm -hmm. I'm more, the things I'm grateful for, I are more to do with personal things. And so the, like for my, for instance, my home, my, um, and especially my home, because we, we have a very, we're very, very, you know, fortunate that we have a very calm, peaceful home. Um, you know, so many families, they argue about things and fall out over silly things and, you know, never speak to each other again. And they, uh, But we're all living together and there's no no wars, you know, touch wood. There's, you know, never Not been sure. any major disagreement. We've been very lucky. We, we always talk about we're so lucky to be united as a family. And I, I'm grateful for that every day. I really, really am. Um. Do you believe in afterlife? Yes. Okay. Uh, so you yes, might I write do. a book uh, there too? <laughs> uh, no, I won't, because uh, it would fall under speculation. Despite, <laughs> <laughs> just, you know, just, I, I, I very much go on facts. I do like, of, of course, because I have a Muslim background anyway, uh, from that perspective, I do. Mm -hmm. um, and I also do by choice because... Mm. Um, not because oh, it brings me comfort or those usual reasons. Um, it's more to do with uh, life making literally no sense unless we persist and we carry on in some other way after we officially, you know, divorce from our bodies. I don't mm. think um, I don't think that there's any other way to look at it. Just because I think that when you understand your relationship with your earthly body as being your cells, every cell in your body is borrowed and has been borrowed by some other creature or by some other thing in the universe at some point. When you understand it's a, a, a borrowing and then on the one side and then on the other side, you're very, very sure of yourself, you know, to kind of borrow from um, old philosophy there that uh, I think therefore I am, you know, Descartes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, it's if, you're, if you're aware of your individual being, as being kind of uh, an aspect of, you know, not completely separate from, but essentially separate from the borrowed part of yourself, then you, it's impossible for you to believe that just because they get, you know, they split, that uh, that ends and they're just batteries for it. I, I can't, um, yeah, I, to me that makes no sense. But that's just, obviously that's my, based on a lot of personal reflection um, and my... Um, obsessive um, thinking about Quran because I'm, it's one of my favourite things to think about. Uh, I, I'm, yeah, again, it's partly because of the religious background originally, um, but um, that book gives me new stuff every single day. Um, so, yeah. So, have you found the purpose of your life? Well, <laughs> I always hesitate to answer this because, you know, when you're discussing it with anybody, uh, mm. for purpose of life, I knew quite, when I was young, I, like 
under 10. By the time I was getting to about age 10, I was thinking about these things. So I knew I wanted to be a writer the moment I learned to read. I knew that. Uh, so at some point I decided I'm going to be, when I grow up, I'm going to be an author. I'm going to write a book. And then as I developed a bit more, I kind of thought, well, you know, I'm a woman and I don't see many women in history who have done anything that is so famous that, you know, that she kind of stands equal to the men in that sense for just sheer presence in history um and i'm sure it's not that there's a lack of talent it's more a lack of acknowledgement or maybe there is something going on so i always thought well as i would like if possible as a woman to do something in my life that is taken as seriously as it would if it were a man but not so it's for, for me to be known not as a woman but as a person in that sense okay that was number two and then the third one I thought well there's not many but women philosophers and ideally I'd like to do something for philosophy if I could in my life so one was so the second one was history and the third is philosophy and weirdly so far it's playing out so I've written a novel um I've written a book and I've written a his book about history and the third thing that I want to write about is something philosophical it's actually um it's religico uh, philosophical if you like it's um it's from quran it's a discovery i've made in the quran and i mention it indirectly in my novel i call it there i call it the cohesive ethics theorem but um, i haven't written about it in any detail yet um, mainly because i am so uh at a loss as to how to deal with it it's a prof profoundly simple idea but you know uh, you know what's about profundity and simplicity it's just it's massive and I know that I need to be able to do it justice and I'm not sure if I can or <laughs> or I hope I can it's, it's you know it's landed in front of me so I'm I'm duty bound to kind of deal with it um so let's see what happens that's uh, so for me yeah I did know my purpose quite early on all right so any message of hope before we end Oh, gosh, uh, we are living in a very seemingly hopeless time. Uh, we've all seen uh, what's been going on, um, the various political problems of this planet, ranging from, you know, all the uh, things like uh, Kashmir, to state the obvious, things like um, uh, the detention of um, uh, Uyghur Muslims, in China um, and uh, all sorts of injustices, you know. Palestine. Uh, what's, uh, pardon? Pal uh, Palestine. Palestine. Yeah, yeah, of course, I'm going. Yeah, and, and not only Muslim countries, there are other there are other nations that are equally, you know, going through all sorts of problems mm -hmm. and uh, the poverty is a major problem across mm -hmm. the planet. How does one find hope when there's so much darkness? Uh, I think it's when we are reaching absolute darkness that we are forced it's, no, it's nothing else to it we are forced to find our own means to create hope and what that means is we have to start taking personal responsibility for what we do and um, if you ask any you know, of the top philosophers of the world what can we do about the climate for instance or the, or the you know, ecologists of the world they'll tell you well it's very easy to take personal responsibility and don't worry about oh well you know everyone has to do it if you set an example in yourself others will automatically follow human beings are very kind of herdish creatures they, they kind of monkey see monkey do the mentality that we naturally seem to possess so um my message of hope is you know if you want to bring hope into the world you have to do it by setting an example first and foremost um, and when you set an example and the people around you then follow then you're making a change and that's that's the message of hope we have at all times, no matter how dark it gets, no matter how dark it gets. Okay. Thank you. And my last question is, what lights you up? That's also hope. Oh, didn't I make it obvious already? <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, my, my niece and nephew like me up. They, uh, they, they make me laugh every day. They make me smile. Uh, okay. They, um, everything. I, I don't know if it's just this generation, but they, they just... Yeah, they just shock me every day with the stuff they come out with. So, um, yeah, and they're another, you know, they're another thing that keep my uh, yeah. sanity uh, alive, if you like, because mm -hmm. of uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Mm. So, yeah, it's probably my niece and nephew. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so right. much for your time. 
so much for your insights, all what you have shared. Really honored for that. So um, would you like to say anything, any any feedback, anything that you felt? Um, I'm very glad that I decided to do the interview. It's been a wonderful experience. Uh, I've, you know, it's had me thinking. Even though I do think a lot about some, a lot of these questions that you asked me, it's it's good to kind of um, vocalise them um, and kind of say something about them. Because as you, when you speak, I think um, you do kind of then reassess the, you know, what am I saying? Why am I saying it? And uh, so you you got me to. I have a bit of an inner reflection again today. So, yes, uh, thank you so much for that. I really uh, appreciate that that opportunity as well. So thank you very much. And I'm very, very glad that I said yes to this interview. I'm, really I'm glad. very glad that you said yes, too, because I am so... No, I was going to say that uh, you, have a, you do have a way of... Uh, you're a very approachable person. So I think that kind of goes in your favour because, yeah, I'm sure, you know, in, in, any number of journalists will probably have very mixed experience they they won't get a, a yes from 99 percent of their mm. their um you know um ideal candidates for mm. interviews it's, it's it, it takes a certain personality to kind of be able to tune in to the individuals that you're trying to reach out to and you, you wish to uh, have a conversation with so uh yeah i think it's to your credit that you've done this in such a way that uh, it's very hard to kind of say, well, no, because, you know, you, you kind of make it very, you know, one, it's very casual and uh, informal, um, and the other is that you do a nice range of questions, so you don't just focus on the subject, you know, whether they're very serious or not, um, and you also go into other areas, and I think that kind of encourages people to think, you know, oh, this appeals to my ego, I'll talk about that. <laughs> so, yeah, no, it does. Yeah, no, it does. It does work. You know, you you do seem to have uh, developed a very good um, process for this. So. Yeah, thank it's you good. for that feedback. That's really helpful. Thank you, Selena, for your time, your feedback, and everything. So thank you very much.